coming up. The International Lunar Station is taking shape. Super Moon. I talk with Jeff Faust about a Trump space policy. We've got some launches on the docket and comments from last week's show. All that and more on this episode of Tomorrow. Welcome to Tomorrow, Season 9, Episode 37 for Saturday, November 12th, 2016. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. Now, before we get started, huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this episode. We are a crowdfunded show. Every single dollar helps. That list keeps getting longer and longer. So thank you to all of the patrons of Tomorrow. Head on over to patreon.com slash tmro for more information on how you can crowdfund the show. Now, before we get into the interview today, um, I did just want to remind everyone, uh, this is a fairly touchy subject subject. Uh, we do have three basic rules here at Tomorrow. They're all very simple. The first is no dying. We do work in the aerospace industry. A lot of people work with uh, explosives and whatnot, so be safe, be smart, no dying. Rule number two, don't be a dick. Treat people like you want to be treated. And rule number three is you I debate the idea, not the person. So no name calling, um, no debating people and their personalities, you debate ideas themselves. Head on over to tomorrow.tv slash rules for more information. Now, because of the particular topic, you know, the Citizens of Tomorrow, you guys are awesome. Uh, we tr traditionally have great comments uh, in our comments area. You all, you treat each other with respect even when you disagree. All I ask is please continue to do that, uh, even with a fairly heated topic. So on that news, uh, we're going to bring on Jeff Faust. He is the senior staff writer over at Space News, or a senior st staff writer over at spacenews.com. Uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, the Donald Trump policy for space. So, uh, Jeff, first off, thank you very much for taking time out of your Saturday and joining us today. No problem. Pleasure to be here. All right. So we don't know a whole lot about what a space policy under Trump would mean, but some of these pieces are starting to come together a little bit. Can you tell us a bit about what we know? Sure. I, you know, the Trump campaign didn't talk much about space during the campaign. That's not surprising. Space isn't a big issue. There are a lot of other much bigger issues um, that got all the attention during the campaign. It was really in sort of the final weeks of the campaign leading up to the election where um, the campaign did bring in a space policy advisor. Uh, he was Robert Walker, uh, former congressman, former chairman of the House Science Committee. Uh, he helped formulate sort of the framework of a policy. And that framework really calls for some very basic, more almost philosophical uh, points. That includes um, promoting commercialization, uh, promoting human exploration, uh, less of an emphasis on earth science, uh, more cooperation between the various branches of the government where it comes to space, um, issues like that. So not a lot of details, not a lot of depth, but you get sort of an idea of what a Trump administration might do um, once it takes office in January. So the big one, the big item you mentioned us uh, in human space exploration is the space launch system. Under Trump administration, have they said anything about SLS? Do we have any insight mm -hmm. as to what me, might be happening with that particular program? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, they haven't specifically said anything about SLS or Orion or the other parts of the exploration program. Um, you can read that to mean that they're not particularly interested in SLS. Um, that they might make changes to that uh, in the future, or simply because they haven't gotten down into that level of detail. And I suspect for the time being, that's really the latter explanation. They really hadn't had the need to think about what they would want to do with SLS, what they would want to do with Orion, what they would want to do with these other systems, um, because space wasn't a, a priority. With a new administration coming in and some decisions to make about who's going to be NASA administrator, um, about flushing out some of those policy basics that they unveiled during the campaign itself, you'll start to see some more details about what they might want to do with some of those key programs. Keeping in mind, I think, and I think this is important, that what a campaign says during the campaign and what it attempts to do may be two different things. What it attempts to do once elected and once what it's actually able to get through Congress can also be two very different things. And how long does something like this take, right? So when Obama took office, uh, it wasn't right away when there was suddenly, it's not like day one he had a space policy. How, how long do these transition periods yeah. generally take? 
Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, a lot of people tend to think of the transition as taking place between Election Day in November and the inauguration in January. In reality, um, that transition can last months longer. Uh, case in point with the Obama administration, you know, they took office in January of 2009. It was four months later in May when they finally nominated Charlie Bolden to be NASA administrator after going through a number of other potential candidates for the office. So I wouldn't be surprised if it takes the Trump administration a while to fill that position simply because it's going to take a while to fill all the cabinet and, and higher level positions out there in the federal government. Likewise, it wasn't until January of uh, 2010, actually February 2010, uh, when they actually unveiled their plan to cancel the Constellation program, to uh, develop the commercial crew program, things like that. So there's going to be a period of transition that will last for many months and uh, until the uh, Trump administration is really able to put its own stamp on space policy. So for the time being, we just sort of look at um, who's involved and what they're saying and uh, try and guess from there what they might do um, in a year or two. So when it comes to the United States president, how much does that matter? There's actually a question in the chat room from, uh, I think it's Ferk Eep, which is uh, how much of the total space business can change or and how much is set in stone for the long term? Yeah, I mean, you know, the federal government, NASA runs on annual budgets, so you can change things on an annual basis if you decide you don't want to continue a particular program or if you want to accelerate a particular program by adding more money to it. That's certainly a possibility. Uh, but again, we're almost uh, ready to get the 2017 budget done. That's one of the priorities for Congress when it returns next week for its so-called lame duck session after the election. Um, the new administration will have to quickly develop a 2018 budget proposal um, shortly after it takes office, so there won't be much time for them to make major changes to NASA there. It's really going to be the 2019 budget proposal, which will come out in early 2018. Um, that they've really had their first opportunity to make major changes to NASA programs. So there's going to be a period of time um, running for, like I said, up, up to a year after the inauguration, um, where NASA programs may more or less continue as they're going now, as the new administration tries to figure out what changes they want to make, what new programs they want to implement, or what existing programs they want to cancel. But it's not just the president, right? I mean, the president can set some stuff, but ultimately it's a combination of the president and Congress together that are going to tell NASA what they're going to end up doing over time. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the president proposes, Congress disposes, is the old saying in Capitol Hill uh, about budgets. Um, you know, the, the president proposes a budget, but it's ultimately up to Congress um, to come up with the appropriations bills to cover that. Um, likewise, you saw in the 2010 debate uh, about uh, the efforts to cancel the Constellation program. You know, they ended up did canceling the Ares 1 and the Ares 5, but they came up with the Space Launch System, which looks a lot like the Ares 5 in many respects, and the Orion program continued. So if a Trump administration came in and said, well, we really want to cancel the Space Launch System, I suspect you will see uh, members of Congress who have uh, their own stakes in the program because of activities going on in their districts or states um, stepping up to fight that effort um, with no guarantee that, uh, uh, that the Trump administration would be successful in any of these efforts. Um, it will depend a lot on their relationships with the Congress and also what sort of priority that they put on space and how much uh, effort they would put in to try and implement their plans if it faces any sort of uh, congressional opposition. One of the things that will also be happening is we're going to be getting a new NASA administrator. Has there been any word or do you have any insight as to who that might be or who they're looking at at this time? Yeah, the, the rumor mill is really starting to spin up now with the, uh, the election now in place. One of the first themes that's really emerged is a congressman from Oklahoma, Jim Bridenstine. Uh, he was just reelected to his third term in Congress. Uh, he represents the Tulsa area. Uh, he serves on the House Science Committee and the House Armed Services Committee, so he's seen a lot of both civil and military space uh, issues, and he's been very active on space policy. Uh, back in April, he introduced legislation called the American Space Renaissance Act, which was a very broad-reaching uh, space bill um, with a number of policy provisions regarding military space, civil space, and commercial space. And so he's definitely thought a lot about it, so he would be a very interesting choice to be NASA administrator um, if uh, that does go forward and, and if, in fact, he's interested in doing so. Um, he's also apparently also being considered for the position of Secretary of the Air Force, um, so it may not be the only job that he has to consider. A couple other names you might hear, one of them is Mark Albrecht. 
uh, back in the George H.W. Bush administration, uh, Bush 41 administration in the early 90s, he was executive secretary of the National Space Council, which was this uh, interagency body that uh, oversaw space policy. And the National Space Council hasn't been in existence since the Bush 41 administration. Uh, but one of the tenets of the uh, Trump campaign space policy was to restore the National Space Council. And Albrecht is involved with some of the NASA transition issues um, as part of the uh, Trump transition team. So he's got a role there. Another name you might hear is Eileen Collins. She is the former astronaut, um, flew on several shuttle missions, was the first female commander of a shuttle mission, as a matter of fact, um, now retired. Uh, but uh, she spoke at the Republican National Convention very briefly um, in support of uh, a reinvigorated space policy uh, and in support of uh, the Trump campaign. So that's another name you may hear. I suspect in the weeks to come, you'll probably hear other names. Um, how seriously they'll be considered or how seriously those people are interested in the position remain to be seen. Uh, but just because you're starting to hear names now doesn't mean that a selection is imminent. It may take weeks or months, um, like I said, um, as was the case with the Obama administration, before the Trump administration finally settles on a pick for NASA administrator. There are a couple questions in the chat room all kind of relating to themselves, all focused around kind of commercial space. Uh, has there been any murmurings about what's going to happen to the commercial space side of uh, NASA, the COTS program and uh, um, commercial crew and whatnot? Yeah, not specifically to programs like commercial crew, but uh, one of the priorities that the uh, Trump campaign mentioned in their space policy was supporting space commercialization. Um, Robert Walker, in, in, in some of his op-eds that uh, we published in Space News and some speeches that he made, talked about uh, turning over low Earth orbit entirely to the commercial sector, bringing in new partners to help support the International Space Station. So I think, if anything, uh, a Trump administration would be more strongly supportive of commercial space, um, the commercial crew program, uh, greater commercialization of the International Space Station, and so on, um, because that would allow them to uh, free up resources to do deep space exploration, whether that's the moon or Mars or elsewhere. It sounds like they're also wanting to work um, more closely with our um, international partners on things like space station, uh, possibly extending the life of space station. One of the things that's been missing up until now is China. We've not allowed China onto the space station. Have there been any talks of allowing them in to the space station program at all, or is that no one said anything in that realm? Yeah, uh, Walker has talked a little bit about that. He is um, supportive to some degree of enhanced cooperation with China, whether that represents just his opinion or a, an opinion shared by the broader Trump campaign remains to be seen. I think any effort to do so is going to face some uh, congressional opposition because it's Congress that has imposed the uh, strict uh, limitations on cooperation between NASA and China and space in a series of appropriations bills um, such that NASA has to get uh, permission from Congress, in essence, to uh, do any sort of cooperation with China, even on issues like aviation and air traffic control or earth sciences or so on, let alone human spaceflight. Uh, so this kind of uh, deviates a little bit from what we're talking about, but it is an interesting question from Space Cookie 84 which is, is there a way to isolate science and space from uh, advancement from turmoil of politics? Because it only takes one bad administration to hamper what's been done so far. Or I think a different way of looking at that is it's very difficult for an a agency like NASA who has very long-term 10, 20, 30, 40-year mm -hmm. goals to have to shift every four to eight years into a, new, into a new way. Is there any way to prevent that from happening? Not under the current structure. Um, we do our appropriations on an annual basis, and that's true whether you're at NASA or the National Science Foundation or NOAA or the National Institutes of Health, to mention several agencies that do science and uh, related research. Um, and so, you know, it's each administration's prerogative to try and put their own stamp into place and their own policies uh, into place onto these agencies. Um, so trying to separate these agencies from politics um, isn't feasible because they are, you know, part of politics. They are part of policy. Um, they are federally funded. They are run by uh, either federal appointees or people who are nominated and then confirmed by the Senate. Uh, 
So one of the other, I'm, no, I'm bouncing around a little bit, but one of the other things that was mentioned is uh, they want to require that all federal agencies develop plans on how they would use space assets and space development, development as you mentioned a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. What could that mean? Uh, you, you know, all space, all federal agencies, that's, that's very broad. That, that doesn't yeah. seem to make a lot of sense in a lot of cases. Yeah, and I don't, that might be one of those issues that they really haven't thought through to that great of detail in terms of uh, how they would implement that. Uh, I think that would go back to this decision to uh, reinstitute the National Space Council, because one of the issues the National Space Council dealt with was um, sort of bringing together all the different space programs across the federal government, whether it's NASA, whether it was in the Defense Department, uh, or elsewhere, uh, and making sure that they are aligned to some degree and that there's no duplication of effort. You'll hear that, I think. Um, continue from the Trump campaign and desire to make sure that there is uh, no duplication of effort among these uh, uh, agencies, that there's no waste of, of funding or, or so on. And that's done to some degree already um, through the White House and through the space policy that's oftentimes handled by the, the National Security Council um, or the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, I think you may see a greater emphasis there, but again, asking all of these federal agencies how they intend to use space, um, you know, maybe sort of a more of a make work exercise than any sort of uh, substantive uh, policy directive. So uh, it sounds like the budget's going to generally, no one's expecting the budget to really increase uh, as well, right? So uh, it kind of sounds like it's going to be generally the same path forward for human space flight with a reduced path forward on Earth sciences. Yeah, I mean, they've... You know, Bob Walker is, has mentioned in conversations that he wasn't expecting great increases to NASA's budget. Exactly what NASA's budget is going to look like, or even the federal budgets overall, is one of the uncertainties that is part of this transition process, um, given all the discussions on topics ranging from massive infrastructure investments to uh, um, removing or replacing Obamacare. Um, so space is sort of a, a small part of that uh, much bigger picture. Uh, so that remains to be seen there. One of the issues that comes up when you mention Earth science is the idea that, and this is not new to the Trump campaign, but it's been mentioned by a number of uh, other Republicans in Capitol Hill in the past, is a belief that there are other agencies doing Earth science and that NASA should be focused on space exploration and that those efforts should be handed over to an agency like NOAA. Well, if that happens, then the funding, presumably, for those programs would have to be handed over to NOAA as well. Um, so it would not be as if you're freeing up money within the NASA budget. Um, you're simply redirecting where that money goes. And it may turn out that NOAA may have to go back to NASA, um, as it does already with a number of its weather satellite programs, and uh, works with NASA to actually carry out some of these satellite programs because NOAA itself doesn't have the same degree of satellite expertise that NASA does, which is why the two agencies will often work together on uh, programs like the, uh, the GOZAR weather satellite that will be launching a week from today um, is a NOAA program, uh, but done in close cooperation with NASA. So even if uh, uh, a new administration attempts to divest Earth science from NASA, um, those other agencies may have to go back to that expertise within NASA uh, to carry out those programs. There's a lot of talk that the Trump campaign kind of wants to, or Trump presidency wants to kind of kill off Earth sciences entirely, but that's not the whole story. Like you mentioned, it's actually just shifting the focus to another agency. And even if that agency has to go back to NASA and they have to work together, that doesn't mean that we're getting rid of Earth sciences, or more to the point, it doesn't mean that we know anything yet about Earth sciences. It's too early to tell. Would that be a fair statement? I think too early to tell is... Uh is a good explanation for that and for a lot of the other policy issues too, simply given it's been only a few days since the election that the transition efforts are only now ramping up and there's been so little details about space policy in general that trying to, for example, figure out what's going to happen to a specific program as a result of the campaign um, and the, the election remains really remains to be seen. Um, in many respects. And also keep in mind that all of these changes will have to go through Congress. And in recent years, for example, the House has attempted to cut funding for NASA's Earth Science Program. The Senate has come in and restored that. And uh, you may see that uh, continuing in the years to come that uh, the, the Congress, uh, particularly the Senate, which is almost evenly divided between Republicans and Democrats, um, may be uh, willing to uh, compromise or temper some of the more extreme uh, proposals that may come out um, of a Trump administration. 
What about military space? Has there been any rumor or talk about what's happening in the military space? space? Well, you know, the, the Trump campaign mentioned in their policy they're very concerned about threats to our military satellites posed by Russia and China in particular. Um, both have uh, tested or suggested they may be testing anti-satellite weapons of some kind. Um, China famously tested an anti-satellite weapon uh, nearly a decade ago and created a tremendous amount of debris. Um, they've been uh, continuing testing, but in not quite the same destructive way since then. So I think you may see more of an emphasis on technologies to either prevent such attacks or to uh, mitigate their effects. They've talked, for example, about the use of small satellites, which has been a topic that the Obama administration has been supporting in recent years, um, making greater use of them uh, to deal with any threats to the larger satellites that they have. Uh, another technology area they've mentioned is hypersonics. Uh, the concern there is that Russia and China may be developing hypersonic technologies for missiles that could defeat missile defense systems. So you may see an emphasis on military development of hypersonic technologies, but that could also have civil and commercial applications as well. I think the takeaway uh, is that really it is too early to tell at this point. However, uh, for people that are worried that there are going to be these huge sweeping changes, it doesn't really sound like it. There might be some, possibly some shift in like how things are done, but generally it's the same path forward. At least that's what it's starting to look like. As you mentioned, again, we're only a few days into it at this point. Yeah. You know, there's a potential for sweeping changes down the road, but certainly not immediately. Um, as I was mentioning, simply because of the, the timing of the budgets, um, the, there will be a 2017 budget likely in place by the time uh, Trump takes office in January. Um, a 2018 budget proposal will have to come out shortly thereafter. So there's going to be some time for them to develop a policy. And even if they develop a policy that attempts to make major changes in much the same way as the Obama administration did in 2010 with their effort to cancel the Constellation program, um, there will be a debate in Congress and no guarantee that those changes will go through. So it's a lot of wait and see and uh, keep close tabs on what's going on. Uh, in terms of what sort of people are involved with the uh, Trump transition when it comes to NASA and military space, uh, as well as uh, some of the policy positions that they may make in the uh, weeks and months to come. All right. Uh, before we go to break, uh, we're trying something new with our guests. Uh, we've got six really quick questions. Uh, these are not related to politics at all. These are all just your personal answers uh, to these questions. First thing that comes to mind uh, when, I, when I ask you each of these. All right. Uh, here we go. First question is, uh, moon or Mars first? Uh, moon first. All right. Uh, liquid or solid propellant? Depends on the application. I like that but, answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's what I say. That's what I say. It's a constant <laughs> debate here. Uh, what should the name of the first vehicle going to Mars be? Uh, ooh, that's a good question. Um, I would call it uh, Armstrong One. Armstrong One. I think, uh, I, I think Blue Origin would probably agree with you. Um, <laughs> when do you think humans will first land on Mars? Probably in the late 2030s. When do you so think you, late 2030s? Like in that in that orbital area, whenever that opens up. One of, the, one of those windows that opens up um, around then. When but do you maybe think, surprise us? When do you think humans will set foot on the moon again? I will say 2025. 2025. All right. And last question: Why space? because I think it's essential to our future and to our both our survival and our growth as a species. Awesome. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Where can f people find more information about you, Space News, and space politics? Well, go to our website, spacenews.com. It's uh, updated all the time with the latest coverage on both the transition and all the other uh, space issues taking place today. Jeff, I hope you don't mind. I'd love to bring you back uh, later on uh, in 2017 when some of this is solidified. We can kind of talk about what the path forward for NASA and military space is going to be in the United States when we have a little bit more data. I'm happy to be back. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, some space news. Yeah. 
Welcome back to 9.37. I, of course, am Carrie Ann Hagenbotham, and joining me shortly will be Jared and Mike. But before we get into news and all the other fun things that happened during this week, I want to give a huge thank you to our Tomorrow Premiere members. These are the Patreon people who have given us $10 or more per seg or for the segment of this show, and uh, their support is just astounding to me every single week. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, as well, we also have the uh, Patreon... Uh, producers. producers, thank you so much. I was slacking there for a little bit. These are the people who've given us $5 or more uh, for each and every segment in each and every show. Uh, they are also getting free worldwide uh, shipping. I almost said wag shipping, didn't I? Free worldwide shipping from our swag store, which is really cool. We have a lot of fun things in there, uh, just like these mugs, as you see us drinking out of each and every week. They are fantastic, like this. Mm -hmm. ah. Mm -hmm. mm, product placement. I know, right? They they hold my liquids perfectly, as, as, <laughs> as I should like them. Uh, in any case, we do have a couple of launches to get to this week. So uh, I uh, like this one, right? Long March 11. Is this the first one that's on? Yeah, we'll go around right. this because yeah. it's beautiful. Uh, China was busy this week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so first off, uh, they, they had a Long March 11, which is a uh, four-stage solid rocket booster. And unfortunately, we weren't able to find any video footage of it. All that we were able to find is some very grainy pictures of the launch. And the whole thing with this uh, particular rocket, the Long March 11, is that it launches from a mobile launch platform. And this launch took place at the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center at 23. 342 Coordinated Universal Time. Uh, and this was on Wednesday, November 9th. You can kind of see in that left shot what the tube looks like from its mobile launcher that it launches out of. Now, the primary payload for this mission is called the X-ray Pulsar Navigation, which is actually a really interesting mission that monitors the periodic X-ray signals that are emitted from pulsars to determine its location instead of just doing uh, star tracking. And it's going to be tracking 26 pulsars that uh, give off their uh, uh, radiation very um, consistently, so they're able to not just know where they are and which direction they're oriented, but also you know the timing and everything like that. And also, this mission deployed four uh, micro satellites as well. So uh, very interesting. And and I also would like to note that the Long March 11 is an extended version of the type of rocket that was used on that anti-satellite test that China did back in 2007. So huh. this this rocket, as well as two <laughs> other rockets that China uses, is what's known as their rapid response satellite launchers. So very interesting to, to see that. And that's probably why we couldn't find any footage of the launch. I, I do like <laughs> how it seems to know where it is, though. So that's just fine, <laughs> even if we don't. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, and Jared, you, you, you should take this next one, because you were there. OK, yes. Right? Uh, uh, actually, just yesterday, out of Vandenberg Air Force Base, there was a launch of a United Launch Alliance Atlas V in the 401 Wait, was there a launch or a launch? A launch. Okay, sure. But there was lunch after. Oh, then perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so it occurred at 1830 Eight, UTC. And if we want to go ahead and take a look at some of that Eight, beautiful launch footage. There seven, you go. <laughs> six, five, four, three, two, one. We have RD-180 ignition. And we have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket carrying Worldview 4 for Digital Globe, doubling the capacity of the world's highest resolution imaging satellite constellation and allowing everyone to see a better world. Aww. And as the ULA folks said there, the Earth Imaging Satellite is for Digital Globe into a sun synchronous orbit known as Worldview 4. Okay, uh, when you say sun synchronous. Uh huh. It only, uh, explain that. So a sun synchronous orbit goes over the same spot at the same time of day during its orbit. So if we put your satellite into an orbit where it crosses over the Earth at 3 p.m., that's what it'll do. So if I really want to look at Mike and whatever he's doing at 3 p.m. every single day, yes, you I can, can put do in that. a sun synchronous, yes, is you that can. what we're saying? Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure. Another, yes. another, another benefit of sun-synchronous orbit is it's kind of like a polar orbit where you're going 90 degrees instead of zero at the equator. Sure. But it's inclined slightly so that during its entire orbit around the Earth, it is always being exposed to the sun so that it can always collect energy with its solar panels. That's one ah, of the big benefits of sun-synchronous orbits. Gotcha. Okay, that makes 
Way more sense now. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Go, I'm, so, I'm sorry. This is an Earth imaging satellite that's sun synchronous. Go on. Yes. It's going to be at an altitude of 617 kilometers. And at the end of the deployment of that of the spacecraft, it, the upper stage also deployed seven CubeSats as well in order to do experiments in orbit. And the footage you're looking at right now is actually footage I took yesterday because I was only about four kilometers from the launch pad. That's uh, gorgeous. Look at you go. That's Doug awesome. was kind enough to give me a 500 millimeter lens. So there you go. That's what it looks like, and this is what it sounds like. And if we look close enough, you can see the high cirrus clouds actually vibrate with the acoustical energy. That's of the so engine, cool. Which was very cool to see yesterday. So very awesome footage. Highly Great job. recommend going to a launch if you've never gone to one. It's pretty awesome. So, very good stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's super awesome. Okay, uh, and we do have another launch. Is that correct, Mike? You said China was been yes. busy, yeah? <laughs> yeah, so actually, uh, so uh, yesterday morning was the Atlas V launch, and then yesterday uh, evening, China launched a Long March 2D launch. And this we do have footage of. Okay. This launched uh, from the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center um, at 23.14 uh, Coordinated Universal Time on Friday. And uh, it was launching the Yunhai-1 uh, weather observation satellite that is uh, looking at the atmosphere and uh, uh, disaster mitigation and stuff like that. And so they were able to successfully orbit that. And uh, um, everything was, was uh, well for that. And, and with uh, these uh, kind of public uh, satellites, uh, it's a lot easier to get information for it than the, the launch that they had <laughs> earlier this week. So yeah. um, very happy saying for them. That it looks like there's pixels falling off of the rocket. <laughs> yeah, well, they, Ben doesn't work for him, so. Ah, uh, yes, they, right, they don't have a, uh, a pixel janitor. <laughs> As, That's right. As Ben likes to say. Okay, so launches, very exciting. Other exciting things. I don't understand this one either. You're going to have to explain this one to me. Uh, okay. Title says a failed solar panel likely blocked Beagle 2. Yes. What the what? Oh, poor Beagle 2, the European <laughs> Space Agency's mission to Mars that landed on the 25th of December on Christmas Day 2003. Aww. Unfortunately, it did not work, and everybody thought Beagle 2 had actually just basically burned up in the atmosphere or crashed on the surface. Turns out they found it with the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter's imager system on board, and they found it. And they were actually able to take images of it and analyze it at De Montfort University. Now, they looked at the reflectivity of the solar panels and generated an accurate 3D model. And basically what they found out is that one solar panel did not deploy from Beagle 2, which blocked the antennae from deploying and sending back signals to Earth. So, Interesting. Okay, oh, so, it was so close one stupid solar working. panel screwed everything up. Is that what you're saying? Yes. That, it was so close to working. That seems like a really terrible thing. And there's um, actually some engineers who say that Beagle 2 may actually be working on the surface of Mars right now. But it because just, of the solar panel not deploying, it's blocking the antenna, and so we can't get a signal, so we don't know if it is working or not. Exactly. So what we need to do is send a person there That's such to pick it up. Crap. And uh, work with it. Okay, so what can we learn from this? Is this I don't want this to sound offensive, okay? But is this like a design flaw? It is. Essentially, it, 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 obviously, it is a design <laughs> issue. No, but you know what I mean. Like, um, but what this proves is that the, that Beagle Two actually, you know, really did survive entry, and it worked, except for that last solar panel coming. Except up. for the, uh, so they had a good they had a good system to land on Mars in place. It's yeah, just I suppose, that that's the true. system to deploy the solar panel. Not so much. So as far as we can tell, it didn't crash or anything. It no. really, it's like it, it landed. landed it's intact. totally fine. Happy, it and worked. then one panel like didn't do this, yes. and so the antenna went, yeah. and then that was it. Yeah, totally S O L. Yeah, it was. It's literally one of those things where it's like, <laughs> just it just that one slim margin of error happened, right. and you lost it. This is why you keep your egos so. in check. Mars. Is oh fine. no, it'll be fine. So. It'll totally be fine. No yeah. big deal. Poor guys. <laughs> Oy vey. Okay, so this, I read this title and this is very interesting to me, but I have a lot of questions. So Mike, we, you're talking about International Lunar Station is taking shape. Tell me more. 
That is right. So um, to kind of give a little bit of back history, the, the, the five biggest uh, space agencies that cooperate on the International Space Station, you know, NASA, Roscosmos, the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency, they do planning meetings all the time to, uh, and the, the, what's kind of been the, the focus of discussion lately has been what to do after the International Space Station. Sure. Now, of course, NASA wants to go to Mars, but the rest of, of those, those agencies want to go back to the moon and want to send human missions to the moon. Even Japan and, and uh, the, uh, the European Space Agency have very much expressed interest in, in wanting to go to the moon and send human missions there. Right. So these planning meetings have been taking place on what to do and there's lots of different modules that are being built for either future stations in, in Earth orbit or for other different applications. And so there was a meeting last month and of course you know this is probably subject to change with the new Trump administration but there was a, leading, uh, a meeting last month where these agencies decided discussed and finalized some plans for making a lunar station either in orbit around the moon or in one of the Earth-Moon Lagrange points so that NASA can use that station as a launching point towards going to Mars and all the other space agencies can use that as a base towards going to the moon. Now what you see on screen right now is one of the Russian hardware pieces that they would be using. Um, that would be the Russian airlock. That would be their contribution to this station. And uh, the other contributions is that the, the United States and Euro uh, the European Space Agency would provide a space tug. Canada would, of course, uh, provide a robotic arm. And then uh, from Europe and Japan, they would both provide uh, some habitation modules to uh, put this together for all the different uses that uh, these agencies want to use it for. So okay, please, so uh, this fire, fire away. This was a legit meeting, right? This wasn't like some sort of villain from a James Bond movie that was like, okay, 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 okay. I know you have an extra arm. Come on, you? You got the arm? Yeah, you've got the module? Yeah, great. Solar, solar panels? Do I hear solar panels? Like, this was a legit <laughs> thing, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I and, just want to make sure. And this is actually... This is actually a fruition of the promises that the uh, heads of these different space agencies mad made last year at the International Astronautical Congress. Okay. You know, all of them were, were saying that they wanted to go to the moon. You know, the head of, of Roscosmos was like, yes, we absolutely want to do this. We want to get our support. China, are you guys in? And they were just like, absolutely. So there might even be uh, more opportunities to work with China on uh, uh, something like this since they want to send human missions to the moon as well. Interesting. And I also, I, you threw it in there, and it was very quiet, and it was very subtle. But you were like, yeah, you know, so NASA can go to Mars, and everybody else can go to the moon. It seems to me that if one person can go to Mars, wouldn't the other people want to also go to Mars? No, am, that would am be I the thought. Right? Like, no, 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 no. You guys, you stay here. We're just going to go over there. It's not a big deal. Yeah, you go, <laughs> you go to where we've gone. We'll go to the new place. Don't get me wrong. I love, I love this idea. I, I just... Uh, it, it clearly needs to be hammered out a little bit more, yeah? Oh, yeah, obviously, yeah. Okay. I mean, this is still very much in the planning stages, but the fact that even this amount of a plan has moved forward to me is very exciting. And with the whole uh, administration change that's going to be coming up and looking at more, wanting to do more human exploration stuff, we might even be a part of going to the moon together as an as, uh, international community. And uh, I would hope that that... All, everyone else would want to go with us to Mars, and we would all do that as an international community as well. So, yeah. Ah, all right. Gets awesome. me excited. Yeah. So, speaking of the moon. <laughs> yes. Supermoon, November 14th. That's right. This is totally your real house, Jared. Tell me more. Yeah. So, the supermoon is coming up, as was mentioned, this Monday. Um, and we're very excited about it because this is the closest supermoon that we have had with the Earth. This is, what, what was it? We did the supermassive black holes last week? Yes, right? we talked about supermassive black holes. Is this like a supermassive supermoon? No, it's not supermassive super. Moon. It's kind of like a super super moon. It's a super super. It is a super super moon, <laughs> but it is not a moon super of the super moon supers. Okay, that's fine. So, that um, more. but it is the closest <laughs> super moon since 1948, and the next closest one will be in 2034. Basically, a super moon is when a full moon occurs near perigee, or basically the closest point of the moon's orbit around the Earth. Um, now to get a better idea of that, there is this little model right here where you've got apogee and perigee. So super moon occurs at perigee when the moon's closest to the Earth, and the size difference will be very difficult for you to actually notice. It's sort of like having a nickel and a quarter held uh, it's about three meters away from you. So ah, okay. you're not gonna notice the size difference. If anybody says, yeah, the moon looks a lot bigger tonight, they're lying to you. Um, but, <laughs> 
if somebody <laughs> says, wow, that moon is a lot brighter than I remember it being, that is true because the moon will be about 30% brighter than a typical full moon will be. So it is going to be really bright on Monday night. And, and so how do I see this? I, do, how I do need you special see, glasses. How do you see the super I need moon? To, I need like a telescope, right? Let me demonstrate for you. Yes. There you go. That's how you see a super moon. You literally just look up in the sky. Around full moon, the sun, or excuse me, the moon rises right around sunset. Okay. So basically, if you really want to see an awesome rising of the moon, go out at sunset. I'll go out probably about 9 or 10 o'clock at night and take a look at it and go, wow, that's a really bright moon. So Now, um, uh, what time is this in, in UTC? Because I'm wondering if I actually need to go out on Monday night or late Monday morning. So it's Ooh. a 11.23 UTC is when the supermoon ah. will tech, that's the, the instantaneous moment that your, your supermoon uh, will occur at. But full moon technically occurs two hours after that. So if you want to, you can go out sort of uh, for us folks here in the United States um, and in, in North and South America, um, it would be a good idea to go out probably on Sunday evening um, to take a look at that, probably near midnight, uh, wherever you may live would be a good time. But honestly, you know, you're going to have such a difficult time telling the difference for the next couple of days. You can go out the night of the 14th and it's going to be just as spectacular as it Vax would be on the 13th or the 15th. Vax Hedrum in the chat room is saying, looking forward to when lunar occupants can talk about a super Earth. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, that's I, you know, awesome. I, th I think because of the relative size of the Earth that you might be able to actually tell the difference huh. um, between a regular perigee and a super perigee. Interesting. Or a super moon, potentially. But, uh, but that may be something, that may be some math that I would have to do. Let's so. go and find out. Uh, let's yeah, just let's go, go and find, find out, out. We says. can do that, too. So. That's perfect. That's a good way so to do perfect. that. So. I love it. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, a little bit more. We've got, we were talking about Long March 5 last week, and it had to be explained to me uh, a little bit of why this was different and why we cared and how a Long March 5 was different than other things with a V or 5 at the end or 4. <laughs> All different. Uh, there's a lot of confusion. Uh, but Mike, you're talking. You're telling us that the Long March Five, while really interesting, kind of was underperforming. Is that correct? What's happening there? Yeah, they had quite a few problems uh, with this particular launch. I mean, on the launch uh, it, before the launch itself, they actually uh, postponed the launch twice and almost missed their launch window. The first time uh, they were having um, uh, some of the vents that vent out some of the uh, oxygen as, as it's boiling off, uh, those weren't working and uh, they had to pause for quite a while to get that to work. And then later, right before the launch, uh, the, the pre-cooler system, there is a system on the engine bells where uh, they, they will put through the, uh, the liquid hydrogen, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, to cool the, the engine nozzle, the bell, so that that when they light it up, you know, they, they aren't able, doesn't melt it. And that wasn't getting down to the, the coldest temperature they wanted it to be at, but they proceeded with the launch anyway. Mm -hmm. And then during the flight itself, there have been some reports that the first stage underperformed. And as you can see, uh, uh, or, or rather what was on screen just a moment ago, uh, with that, the upper stage engine, their new YZ upper stage, had to kind of uh, compensate for that and uh, put it, the satellite into its uh, geosynchronous transfer orbit. So it's, it's kind of like the Atlas mission uh, uh, several missions ago where the Atlas first stage didn't perform as well as expected and then the Centaur upper stage right. was able to compensate for that. So that is a, even though it was a kind of like a partial failure, if, if you will, with the uh, first stage of the, of the Long March 5, it, I think that it's really awesome. That's why I was so excited about this new upper stage that when they have a problem like that, that this new upper stage is able to compensate. So uh, even though they had some problems, it still was a successful mission and uh, means a lot of new capabilities for China. That's, yeah. I mean, as long as you're learning from any sort of failure or misstep, uh, then then you're still learning, right? I mean, uh, yes. Right? Exactly. Awesome. Absolutely. All yeah. right. Uh, one more thing, because again, this is another thing that I don't completely understand. Uh, <laughs> so there's, uh, all right, you start. Okay. So there is <laughs> a, a so there was a new study that was put out by the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope using an instrument called Spheres, yes. which basically is supposed to look at exoplanets and take 
the best images that we can of them. So instead of looking at exoplanets, they mm -hmm. looked at what are called protoplanetary disks. So these are disks of gas and dust and material that are going around little baby stars. Of course, when I mean little baby stars, I mean a couple million years old. Right. Um, and this is essentially um, what we would call the beginnings of a potential solar system. Okay, so when you're saying protoplanetary disks, because these look like rings to me. Yes. Right? Like you They would can be in rings. Okay. Oh, these but are, see, that's these a are squirrel. actual these are actual images, by the way. That, well, these are not computer simulations, these amazing. are actual images of the protoplanetary disks. So okay, so they're not they don't always necessarily manifest in a ring kind of form like no. we would see around like Saturn, Jupiter, Neptune, Uranus. Yes. They can be sort in this sort of spiral pattern and when and when you look at these patterns, you're seeing the gra the influence of the gravity of objects that are going around that star. So in this case, you're looking at two planets larger than Jupiter mm -hmm. flinging that material around as they orbit around. And they're orbiting around a star, because this yes. looks like a black hole. Is that just because of the coloring and yes. what have you? Yeah, okay. the, the light from the star has been blocked out. Okay. And we're looking at the light from the star reflecting off of the material around it. And so then what, what does this information actually give us other than really freaking cool images like this? Well, besides the really cool images, <laughs> um, what this information gives us is it, it lets us go back and look at our computer models that we develop uh, to try to understand the formation of our own solar system. Okay. Because we've got a lot of material in our solar system. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, a, uh, I, wouldn't, I don't want to call it too complex because there's probably solar systems out there that are more complex than ours are. Sure. We just haven't found them yet. Right. Um, but our solar system seems to be a very complex exception compared to most other systems that we see out there. Oh, we're special so snowflake, we are special. aren't we? Um, <laughs> but we're also probably not special. Um, so we're special, but not at the same yeah, time. Yeah, well, that's, um, that's not always the case. So this allows us to go back and look at our computer models and see if the formation of uh, things actually does end up the way that it should. Okay. And it looks like our computer models are correct. All right. And that's what's, that's what's awesome, is that computers, our simulations are confirming what nature actually can do. That, okay. So. That's awesome. Very I I really like that. Uh, yeah, somebody in the chat room, uh, Citizen74662, was saying, is this the opening credits from Doctor Who? <laughs> right? Kinda right? Like it. Oh, yeah. it's so funny. Uh, anyway, so yeah, really gorgeous. So. I think that's about enough for now because uh, we got we have a lot of other stuff we still need to get to. We have your questions and comments and concerns and complaints from last week's show coming up right after this break. We will uh, we will do all of that coming up. Stay with us. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort. Help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. And 
welcome back. Now, before we get to the comments from last week's show, we do want to give a huge shout out to all of our patrons of tomorrow. Of course, we have our tomorrow premiere members. These folks give us $10 or more per episode. They get access to our Slack channel. We also have our tomorrow producers who give us $5 or more per episode who get free worldwide swag store shipping. We've also got our tomorrow plus Patreon Plus members. These folks get early access to After Dark in the full show. And then in addition to that, we do have our Tomorrow Patrons, where you can give up to $2.49 to get your name in the show, access to Google Hangouts, and other fun things. And if you would like to help crowdfund the shows of Tomorrow, you can head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. And we're back at it again here at the desk. Everybody's here. I guess the desk of tomorrow. The desk of tomorrow. Um, <laughs> I guess it's time for comments, right? You know, I just realized I have not figured out the Orbit 10 comments section. Yes, let's do, uh, let's do okay. comments. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, on that note. Capcom. <laughs> not sure so, what you meant by that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking live. There you go. I mean, might as well. Uh, just as a reminder, last week's episode we were talking about Vector Aerospace. Mm. Uh, so the Jim Cantrell. With that. Jim Cantrell, yep. here for thank you. I was like, with Jim, that guy. With that <laughs> guy, Jim with a C. It wasn't written in here. I apologize. I, I really, I really liked that interview. That was, uh, that was pretty cool. That yeah. was good. Yeah, that was good. And there's some really great comments about it. Uh, so the first one, however, it's coming up. This one's from YouTube. This is from Michael Wright. It says, like the new news segment, Carrie and asking questions about things really puts things in perspective. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, I agree. Mostly that's just Carrie and going, I don't understand any of these things. Tell yeah, me but, more because I don't understand not, most of these things. We have a unique audience. <laughs> the, the citizens of tomorrow are everywhere from people who um, are just kind of generally geeks and, you know, kind of understand things, but maybe they're just now getting into space. Sure. Uh, so they don't have that fundamental knowledge yet because they haven't been exposed yeah. to it. Right. They're not, I mean, they're certainly not dumb. They just, you haven't been exposed to that knowledge. Exactly. Uh, and then you've got everything in between all the way up to rocket scientists actually making rockets to go to space. So the challenge of a show like this is to make sure that we don't we don't end up in that just that segment that's close to the rocket scientists. We try to make it as broad as possible. So if you're excited about space and you're just getting started, we have a no acronyms policy, right? So that yes. we're not speaking in gibberish to people who don't know what the acronym is. It's mean. still sometimes gibberish, let's be honest. But mm. then sometimes <laughs> it is still gibberish because there's a lot of like, I don't understand what some of these terms mean, even though they're not acronym acronyms. And that's where I think that really helps saying, okay, wait, no, hang on. What does this mean? Right. Uh, so, yeah, as you guys have noticed and as we've talked about, we've been tweaking the news segment, trying to find the right and proper format. And I think we're, uh, we're quite a bit closer now. I think, uh, I think we're getting there. Yeah. Uh, uh, and as, as I've been saying for like the last three, four weeks now, uh, whether you like it or hate it, whatever, um, leave your constructive criticism as a comment. Let us know what you think. And yeah. we'll continue to tweak until we get it right. Absolutely. I think we're a lot closer, though. I think, I think we're really... Really, yeah, it's really, really fun, and we really get to dive deep into the stories and, and help you guys understand why these things are important. And that is that is the key, the critical key. I, I think the Orbit and 10... I feel like as a presenter, too, with all the research that we do, it's so easy to fall into that trap of assuming that, you know, yes. everyone knows what we're talking about. So, yes. you know, there might be some very important stuff that we might just gloss right over. So I'm really liking this new format, too, to to go into depth of that so that we're clear of, of whatever it is that we're talking about. Uh, Orbit 10 is going to be fun because we have a new set, and um, I was I was doing some of the wiring for that this last week. So it's going to be uh, it's going to be pretty cool. I'm excited awesome. for for you guys to have kind of this. Uh, you're going to have to stand, though. That's the only down. I'm fine with that. I yeah. can stand. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah. I have legs. Uh, Citizen Big Number says, you guys need a glossary of rocket engine names. Yeah, no joke. Rocket engine oh, names? Yeah, yeah. there's like RD-180, RD-191, uh, well, okay, RS-68A. So that's actually a valid point. All How do we deal with the that? things. Like, maybe we create... Actually, it's not about idea. half maybe, of them have numbers, and some of them don't, and then some of them maybe have create, things that make sense, and others don't. And I don't know who does the... We should create. Holy we can create just static graphics in the Orbit 10 design that have like you know an RD180, like who made it, when it was made, you know, just basic stats on it that we can go to. And, yeah. Uh, and says uh, yeah. rocket and then you've also got yes. like the Atlas V, like uh, you know, four, four, one. 
Yeah, right. Configuration or the delta uh, so, four. Well, I mean, it just it also gets confusing when, like, say, right, yeah, for, yeah, there's the RD line of engines, right, that um, mm -hmm. are typically Russian-made engines. But then there's other people who are using the RD yeah. line of engines that are not Russian companies. And then there's like other there's like the BE engines that are some of them are based off of the RD engines, but some of them aren't. And like I don't and the BE <laughs> are from. Uh, uh, Blue, Origin. Blue Origin. Thank you. Blue yeah. Origin. Oh, like, I can't... Oh, my God. But you have the RS series from Aerojet Rocketdyne. Right. <laughs> R-D-R-S-B-E-B-4-B. -E oh, Neural so pilot. frustrating. What about an info box in the lower third of the screen? That's not a bad idea either. Yeah. Anyway, and actually, so that'd be something that, you know, Dutta, you might know in advance. Ooh, this, that's actually... Uh, you're watching us build Orbit 10 in real time right here. <laughs> yes. Here we are, doing it live on the show. Yeah. <sighs> I mean, it, I, as you guys know, this is... Uh, we're in our permanent space, but this is a temporary setup. Uh, and we're just kind of... What you don't see is that week after week, we actually move a little bit. So um, we're sometimes a little bit further, you know, that direction or sometimes a little bit further this direction, depending upon where the construction <laughs> requires we go. Uh, so in this shot, did we zoom in enough? I think I zoomed in enough, like Just 10 seconds prior to coming back, you can actually see like right over my shoulder is a bunch of wood. Anyhow. It is. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, yeah. I do like the rocket cheat sheet too. And actually um, that along with a better viewing experience on tmro.tv slash live where you'll have a better chat and viewing experience. The calendar is going to kind of go away and turn into a button you open, click on. To, there's going to be a bunch of changes. Uh, it's going to all be awesome, but you, you do have to wait until Orbit 10 for a good chunk of that. We're focusing on our, all of our attention on Orbit 10 at this point. Yes. We're playing with Season 9 to make Orbit 10 even better, if that makes sense. Stay with us. It's, it's working. Okay. <laughs> so, next comment comes off of YouTube. This is from a good friend of ours and one that we have interviewed before, Mr. Everyday Astronaut. And Everyday Astronaut says... My favorite part of this is how we're talking to a guy who's the CEO of a budding rocket company who's just hanging out in his modest home office with a window air conditioner. It just shows space is not just for nations anymore, but it's trickled down to ambitious entrepreneurs and tinkerers. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that word. Tinkerers. Thanks for that, everyday tinkerers. astronaut. But tinkerers. Uh, I agree. I think it's really cool uh, that you can basically build... Dave Mastin is another perfect example of that. Yeah. Is he just kind of went out and built a rocket company, right? Uh, JP Aerospace, um, Electron Copenhagen Rocket. Copenhagen Suborbitals. Copenhagen Suborbitals. Yes. That, I mean, that's like volunteer. That's like, that's almost a, cra uh, that's basically a crowdfunded rocket program. Yeah. Right? I mean, that, and I keep saying, I'm not sure a crowdfunded rocket program will work. I don't see it, blah, blah, blah. And then Copenhagen Suborbitals, right? That's, that's basically what they're doing. Um, they're the good kind of crazy. I like it. I like those guys a lot. <laughs> they are. Yeah. They right, totally yeah. are. Yeah, they're yeah, the yeah. right kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Hi, Mads. Uh, yeah. So um, <laughs> it is an interesting and amazing time in which we live. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Very exciting. Very uh, next comment comes off of Patreon from a one Kevin McCoy. It says, this was a great interview and I enjoyed learning about Vector's plan to use smaller rockets, but when it really clicked for me was seeing their rocket being pulled through town by a pickup truck. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty cool. That was pretty awesome. It, it's, I mean, talk about perspective, right? Yeah. It's both large and small, Yeah. Uh, but then it's uh, scrappy in that they're just using a pickup truck to move their rocket with their strong back. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's... I kind of want to do that. Right? On a regular basis. I kind of don't want you to Just do that. Just kind of tow a rocket out <laughs> of the Jeep. W would you? Dude, traffic is bad enough in LA the way it is. Your Jeep, you know, you is, want to your Jeep is slow enough yeah. the way it is. Well, That's true. I mean, you can big. barely keep up with us when we're going to lunch, and I can only imagine how oh. how painfully slow it would be how if many, you had a rocket at the back of your Jeep. How many times do I have to explain this to people, which is that a Jeep cannot be driven fast? Just, just... I, oh... Yes, rocket balloons. There we go. No, I, you don't even need that. You just need to light the engines. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so you're not really towing the rocket, more like the rocket's pushing you down the freeway. Wow. Well, that's how you make that's a Jeep go enough. fast. Is that, it's like a, a jet assisted takeoff, but instead it's a Jeep assisted takeoff. Jeep assisted. Oh my gosh, there needs to be a button in there in your Jeep. I'm, yep. I'm doing it. I'm oh, making it happen. Oh, right man. after the Project Orion uh, high power rocket, we're going to make a Jeep assisted. Take off. Jeep assisted. I don't know. All we right. just have balloon rockets. It'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, sure, you'll use them whenever you get stuck in the mud. Yes. <laughs> yes. How often do you get stuck in the mud? 
Uh, well, so far once this there year. There was that one show. Oh, that's right. We had pictures of <laughs> so, you. It was hilarious. That's right. All right. So, Next yeah, time. and you guys I feel laughed like, at me. I feel like we're crushing Space Mike. Like my shoulder, <laughs> bam! Oh, although you, your, your computer is shining in my eyes pretty bright. Is that what you it is? Yeah, it's totally. Yeah, hang on. I will ah, say, there we go. The, Thank you. A few ah, people in the chat room better. are a little weirded out that uh, you and I have flip flop spots, but that's because I'm in control now. So there's that. <laughs> You'll just have to deal. Sorry. That's a little freaky. Yep. So next comment comes off of YouTube. This is great. I actually had to look up the pronunciation. I hey, hey, what? Hang on. <laughs> she did. She legitimately spent a good half hour looking oh, up this pronunciation. And what did we end up determining? <clears throat> Tobias Hünke. <laughs> Hopefully that's correct. Well. Hi, Tobias. How's it going? Tobias. It's not, you know, so how's name, maybe? No. Yeah. Tobias Hünke says, and that, gentlemen, ladies, is why you cut MDF outside of any closed room. Yep. Uh, <laughs> medi yeah. What is it? Medium density. Yeah. What's the F? Medium density fiber. fiber board. Fiber board. Yeah. So it's MDFB. So uh, I've actually renamed it. Uh, uh, I think it's like hyphenated. Uh, it's actually FDF. It's fairly dense. Fiber. Freaking dense fiber Frickin board. De it is legitimately. Uh, <laughs> there are anywhere there was a cable running on the ground, um, you can actually see the outline of the cable now because on yeah. either side of it is covered in a light coating of MDF dust. It's amazing. Through the entire, not just the room in which, not just the studio space, it permeated everything in here. Yep. It is an absolute mess. And we didn't know that it was gonna be this messy. So while we did cover a good chunk of our, I'm pointing down as if you can see it. A chunk of our floors are covered in plastic, but the plastic ends like, Right here, Mike's yeah. looking. Can you see it from there, Mike? Can, can yeah, right, down yeah, yeah, right down yeah. here. Look right down here. You see it right down there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. So anything beyond the plastic. It uh, is. CJ says it's like a chalk outline of dead snakes. It's very similar to that. Yes. <laughs> uh, and somebody else pointed out that it's fumkin dense. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's a so, good point. No, no, they can't hear uh, they, you. Right, so we're all <laughs> silent right now, and they, nobody understands why. That's what Dad is, is pointing out is each sheet of MDF is just under 100 pounds. Sure. Uh, and he didn't want to, and we are uh, one story up. We're actually like a story and a half up, I think, because yeah. these are tall buildings. So we're, we're on the second story, uh, which means we had to like carry it up this winding stairwell, which was not pleasant, to say the <laughs> least. So yes. what he did not want to have to do is then take it all back downstairs again, cut it, and then bring it back upstairs. Because, you know, some of these boards, you know, even though he's cutting them, they're still a good 70-plus pounds. Yeah. Yeah, they're so, heavy. Yeah, anyhow. Yeah, Space Vogel says it feels like we're in After Dark already. It does, in fact, feel like we're in After Dark already, but we're not. Although we're going to go to After Dark now so that Ben yes. can continue to bore us all with MDF stories. This is <laughs> what Doesn't happens when wonderful. she's in the captain's chair. This is exactly she what happens. She controls the show. I have no control now. We have to go. Yeah, this is <laughs> very true. And in any case... If you Good feel fun, like joining everybody. us, right, for more more tomorrow, tomorrow, or next week, I suppose, our next week's guest will be John Powell from JP Aerospace. Not to be confused with Japanese aerospace. Uh, that, of course, is next week, tomorrow. Space. Those are the balloons in orbit. <laughs> the balloons to yeah, orbit. The balloon yes. castles That's in the my sky. balloon castle. I We talked about balloon castles on the show, and I, the show, my Minnesotan came out. <laughs> and uh, I was super excited about this, and I'm like, we're contacting them, and we're bringing them on. And so that's what they do, and it's going to be awesome. So on that note, thank you guys so much for watching After Dark's Up Next.